Today, uh, in the first lecture, I talked about um, theories of politics and I gave you a 10 minute stop tour through political philosophy for the last 2,000 years and gave you one or two anthropological contributions to this. This time, I, I want to talk about nationalism and war. It's a serious topic, and I hope that something I say will be of value and use to you. As I've mentioned before, if you want to follow up any other topics I go into in a bit more detail than my sister and granddaughter, really, um, that's where I expand a bit. I want to start with my famous, uh, favorite quotable quota of the moment, who is Albert Einstein. Uh, one of his remarks was, nationalism is an infantile disease. It is the measles of mankind. In other words, we often get it as a disease in our childhood, but we should be growing out of it. He was writing this in the context of the rise of fascism in Germany. I want to talk about this infantile disease and whether we can grow out of it, but in order to overcome diseases, um, you have to know what causes them. And so I'm going to give you a macro view of war and nationalism. Obviously, it can only go into some things. First of all, a, an overview, which is summarized in some ways here on the right. The red, which you can't read at the back properly, is sentiment, territory and sentiment. First in history, for the first 90% of history, there were just human bands. Uh, hunters and gatherers. They didn't have a state, they didn't have nationalism. The, build, the building blocks were just small groups, as you see, of people who shifted around on the top. Then, in the last 10,000 years or so, there emerged tribes a little longer. Here we, we do have the beginning of sentiment. We and I'll go into this in more detail later, we the so-and-sos, we the Noah, we the Dinka, and then within that, we the people of so-and-so lineage within the Dinka and the Noah. Dinka is spelled D-I-N-K-A, and I'm sure you know how to spell Noah by now. And you we are. Um, <coughs> there really aren't, though, nations. I mean, the American Indians and others call themselves First Nations, and good luck to them, but it, it's not nationalism in the modern sense. It is, a, but there is a sentiment of we, the, the Cherokee, or the, whatever the, the First Nation is. But there is no structure of a state. You can speak about the Franks in France, but you can't yet talk about the French. So you have tribes. But then, the next big stage which um, occurred three, four thousand, five thousand years ago is the origins of the state, which I talked about a lot in the last lecture. There are structures, there are civilizations, there are empires, there is China, there is ancient Egypt, there is Greece, there is Rome, Aztecs, Incas, and so on. They are the structures of the state, but there aren't nations. You don't, a few people at the top probably feel we are so-and-so Chinese, or we are Inca or whatever, but the literate, um, but the vast ma majority of the population don't feel identified with some uh, group which they belong to, and they feel closely allied to through sentiment. Then, finally, the two come together. You get the nation state, and you have the territorial um, structure filled in with the sentiments of belongingness. This is where we all now inhabit. It's just useful to remind you of how very recent this is. Um, I'll go into this in more detail. But for most of the world, the nation state is only often just 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. And in most of the world, it's maximally 100, 150 years old. So while we take nationalism and nation states as the building blocks of our world to a large extent, it's a very recent invention as our point out to you. 
so there's been a movement from um, tribes to states, and I think what Einstein was talking about is that there should be, and there will be, a movement from nations to something beyond nations. It's quite clear that we can't go on as we are at the moment, at two, in two obvious ways. One is ecologically, to use the nation state as an ecological unit to pretend that global warming isn't happening because you don't want to believe it in your particular neck of the woods. It's, it's not going to go on working. We are interconnected ecologically and therefore we have to treat the world as one system, whether we believe it's Gaia um, or what whatever <coughs> system. So some larger unit than the nation state has got to do with the ecological crises. And secondly, politically, we can't go on as we are. Um, it was just about feasible to live in a world of constant warfare between these units of nation states, a war of all against all in the Hobbesian sense, when they could basically um, fight and leave the rest of the world more or less all right. But now, with nuclear weapons and other things, a war between two nuclear powers will destroy the whole world. And therefore, we can't go on at that level of um, war of all against all. And I don't think we will. I think the good news is that the bipolar worlds, the world of mutually assured destruction between two rivals, which was first of all evident in the struggle between capitalism and communism <coughs> in the period I was brought up in the Cold War, and then after a short cessation, is now attempting to be revived in a binary war between the West and Islam. These are just temporary riches because what is going to happen clearly in the next 20 years or so is that the, the world, a divided world between two superpowers or a superpower which is far superior to every other superpower and then can define who the enemy is and fight with them is nearly over. In 20 years, unless we destroy ourselves before that, you will have five, six, seven powers more or less equal. China will probably be more powerful than America. Japan will be nearly as powerful and certainly economically as powerful. Western Europe, South America, India, maybe Russia, and so on. You'll have six or seven big players in the world, more or less equal. At that point, it becomes sensible for the biggest player of the moment, which is America, to stop trying to push its will against all the others because it can easily be outweighed by the other four or five. It's like a playground with one very large boy or girl in it and lots of small boys or girls, which is the current situation, but that won't last for more than another 10 or 15 years. And then we might get to the Einsteinian world of growing out of the measles of nationalism. It will bring its own problems, super states, Leviathan, and so on, but it will be different. So I now want to go back over this in a little more detail. <coughs> the invention of nations. If I asked you what your nationality was, um, what would you answer? <coughs> well, I don't know, some of you would say Scots, Irish, Welsh, British, French, Chinese, whatever. Um, if I asked you how long that particular nationality you belonged to had been around, you would probably assume, as I mentioned, that it had been around for quite a long time, that being Chinese or British or Japanese was an old condition. Behind your answer is obviously the the last model here, the idea that you, there are bounded political, possibly linguistic, cultural and territorial units which we belong to. And we tend to think, because this is now the current world situation, that these, this is a universal human phenomenon. That the ideology, the mixture of sentimental <coughs> ideology with territorial, linguistic, legal and other boundaries is the obvious way to organize human beings. Um, if you're interested in nationalism, in the, there's an encyclopedia of in anthropology edited by someone called Ingold, Tim Ingold, I-N-G-O-L-D, 
an <coughs> article by Anthony Smith, who's one of the three or four great theoreticians of nationalism on nationalism, nations and nationalism, in that is a very good short introduction overview, and he defines on page 725, <coughs> I won't read it out now, but it's basically, as I said, it is a territory and a sentiment <coughs> combined. Um, so, we have this, hunter-gatherers have no nation and there are no identities. Tribes have no nations, <coughs> except in the sense of First Nations. So when was nationalism invented? Um, many people now argue that it was invented about within the last 200 years. For example, Michael Mann, and I've written the names up, writes that nationalism, both as ideology and movement, is a wholly modern phenomenon. The, the people who believe this are known as modernists. And the two most famous of them are Ernest Gellner and Benedict Anderson. Ernest Gellner's little book on nations and nationalism is perhaps his most widely known book. I was sitting <coughs> drinking wine a few, a few feet away from Ernest when he was writing that in a peasant village in North Italy. I never realised, we never talked about what he was writing, because in a few weeks he wrote this brilliant book on nations and nationalism, which is a delightful reading as all of his work is. And if you wanted to read one short <coughs> things on nations and nationalism, have a be amused and intrigued by Ernest's ideas. Uh, he was a professor of anthropology, predecessor to Marilyn Strathairn here. Gelmer and uh, Benedict Anderson pointed out that there were no nations in India or Africa <coughs> or in the near or far east, probably in 1800. There were states and empires. But if you ask someone, what nation do you belong to, people would say, what do you mean? I've never heard this word, I don't know what you mean. Um, even if, and this always surprised me when I first heard it, that even if you said the same thing to someone in France, or Germany, or Italy, or Spain, 150 years ago, the middle of the 19th century, you said to a Catalan, a Basque, a Breton, a Languedocian, a Hessian, you know, what is your nation? They would say, we don't have, well, what do you mean? And then when you explain it, they say, well, ordinary people, this, we don't have a nation. The unification of the two nations with the sentiment of we are Germans, we are French, uh, is very recent. There's a, a classic book by Eugene Weber, spelt in the same way as Max Weber, called Peasants into Frenchmen. And his argument, which is very convincing, is that the French only became French between 1870 and 1914. In other parts of the world, it's even more recent. I remember my shock when I went to the Himalayas, which I'll show you a, bit, a little bit of film of, and I asked the people in the hill village above Pokhara in central Nepal. Um, we were talking about Nepal, and they said, oh yes, Nepal, that, that's over there. And it was the middle of Nepal, as far as I was concerned. I said, what do you mean? They said, oh, well, Nepal is the Kathmandu Valley. We call that Nepal. We're, we are Gurungs. We are the people of, who live in this area. We are not Nepalese. This is 1968. So, um, basically, in many parts of the world, it's very recent. And basically, the, the, the most attractive and ingenious theory to account for this is Benedict Anderson's famous book, Inventive Communities. Uh, imagined Communities, sorry. Imagined Communities. Um, this idea that what you do to make a nation, to convert it from a state into a nation, is that you imagine you are united, is actually not original to Anderson at all, although it's well um, analysed in his book. It's in de Tocqueville, in Democracy in America. Um, he doesn't use the word imagine, but he uses the word ideal. We have an ideal of we are American. And in that wonderful book, Democracy in America, for instance, he says in volume one, page 202, the government of the Union rests almost entirely on legal fictions. The Union is an ideal nation, which exists, so to speak, so to say, only in men's minds, and whose extent and limits can only be discerned by the understanding. <coughs> 
This is imagined. It's not, it's artificial, it's created, it's constructed, and yet it feels natural. His theory as to what caused it anticipates a lot of Anderson too, because he said it was caused by the associational nature of America, that people join together and feel they are part of lots of associations and communities which spread up to the level of the whole of America. And also he saw the role of printing and newspapers in unifying. He gives accounts of going to remote parts of America, meeting people right out in the backwoods, and they would ask him questions about European politics because they'd just been reading the newspapers. They felt part of America and they felt interested in the rest of the world. The effects of um, <coughs> typography, newspapers, print, the famous phrase of Benedict Anderson is print capitalism. And the print part of it is in Tocqueville and even more so in Marshall McLuhan in his understanding media and the whole of that famous 1960s uh, attempt to understand the effects of um, the printing revolution. He says, for example, um, of the many unforeseen consequences of typography, that is Gutenberg, the emergence of nationalism is perhaps the most familiar. Political unification of populations by means of vernacular language group groupings was unthinkable before printing turned each vernacular into an extensive mass medium. The tribe, an extended form of family of blood relatives, is exploded by print and is replaced by an association of men homogeneously trained to be individuals through printing. This led on to his famous second thesis, is that if printing turns us into nations, then electronic media will turn us into a global village. He developed mm -hmm. the phrase, the global village, and I think this is indeed what has happened and that his predictions are coming true, which is the way in which nations, the measles of nationalism, somewhat. <coughs> now, Anderson doesn't um, acknowledge any uh, dissent from either Tocqueville or McLuhan, but his ideas are roughly the same. And But he adds another one which is useful, and that is that print capitalism. Capitalism, by that he means that human beings are united by the market, by money, by market economies, by the urban way of life, monetized values, division of labor. We all feel we become, putting it rather facetiously, we all become British because of Sainsbury's, or as I should say, Tesco's. Um, this, the links of market relations between money and the stock exchange and, and so on, joins us all together. A variant of this theory that it, uh, it's somehow economic, an economic-based nationalism, is in Ernest Gellner's main theory. His main theory is that the root cause of the sudden rise of nationalism in the last couple of centuries is industrialism, the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution caused a new kind of economy based on endless growth, a high division of labor, and a lot of social mobility. And for this to work, you needed a nation. It wasn't enough just to have peasants <coughs> and states. And it also had the effect of creating a nation because the wealth that, this is the second part of this thesis, the wealth that industrialism created allowed you to have a national educational system. As he put it, I mean, many people in the past had felt we are, whatever it was, Chinese, Japanese, English, but the majority of the population didn't feel this. What create, co caused them to feel it was not just newspapers, but the ability to read newspapers. In other words, a good educational system which made the high ideology or the ideology of the elite go down to the bottom. And this is, a, in fact, a central theme of Eugene Weber's work, that what turned France into a nation was education, a common education. Um, so, this is the, the theory. Now, there is one, to my mind, weakness in this, and that is that uh, a lot of the theoreticians, like Gellner and like Anderson and like Hobsbawm and others, model their idea of the history of nationalism on continental, Central European, West European 
sources. And I think it is true that in that area, um, that is in France, uh, Czechoslovakia, which is where Gellner was interested, particularly where he came from. And those sorts of areas, nationalism is, is recent and constructed. Um, but from my own background as a historian, having studied English history from the Anglo-Saxons upwards, I've always felt uneasy about applying these models to the English case. I think that the idea that the Industrial Revolution created nationalism in Holland, for instance, in the 17th century, is ridiculous. The Danes, the Swedes under Gustavus Adolphus, the Portuguese in the 16th century, the English, and in the Far East, the Japanese, had much of the sentiment, as well as the state structures, well before print capitalism. I mean, they may have had some commercial capitalism, I think that's important, and they also may have had quite a lot of education. But it didn't all suddenly erupt in the last 200 years. Um, and it was particularly small peripheral entities, as I, you notice from Portugal, Holland, England, Sweden, <coughs> Japan. Those small peripheral places, often in opposition to continental forces, had a sense of identity and nationalism a long time ago. They often had a common language. I mean, England had a more or less common language in the 12th, 13th century, a deep common legal system, common political system. And it felt the, it's not just a fantasy in, in Shakespeare's mind when he gives uh, Henry V the famous speech before Agent Um The world that Shakespeare portrays is one of a nation state, and I think it's a lot older than that. Turning to the consequences of nationalism, um, what it did was to change the nature of. Um, not only people's sentiments within, but the relations between the powers, and you go on to get, you get the rise of international warfare of a new kind. Um, and I'll go into that in the second half of the lecture. Just finally reflecting on the idea of invention of tradition. This is a famous idea from Hobsbawm and Ranger. Um, in their book, The Invention of Tradition. It's very difficult, um, though I try and explain it again and again to my granddaughter, very difficult for us to believe that the world that we inhabit is so highly invented. It's quite liberating because you realise that, that things are changeable. I mean, a, a very small example I give to her is Cambridge. You probably think Cambridge looks quite old. Most of it was invented in the last few years. It was destroyed in the 19th century, the architecture. There's very little pre-19th century architecture, <coughs> apart from the front of St. John's and a bit of Trinity and King's Chapel and so on. 99% of it, 90% of it is modern. But it's been reinvented. And a more famous example which Ranger and Hobsbawm take is the King's College choir, a carol service, which I go to every year as a fellow. That was reinvented in the 1930s. It's not a medieval thing. But rather like the famous horse race in Siena, the Palio, there were, there were medieval roots, and they re. When you invent a tradition, you don't start from scratch. You usually take bits and pieces from something older and then adapt it and change it. And this is how societies evolve and change. But most of our world, and this is the last point I'd like to make because I really like this quotation most of our world is not our own and of our own invention, or even our own society's invention. And it's very important that. It, when we live in a global world, we realise that much of when we say we are whatever nationality we say we are or identity we say we are, this is a fiction. The famous example of this is given by Ralph Linton, the anthropologist, who described the life of an average American at that period in the 1950s, an American anthropologist. He says, he awakens in a bed built on a pattern which originated in the Near East. He throws back covers made from cotton, domesticated in India, or linen, domesticated in the Near East. He takes off his pyjamas, a garment invented in India, and washes with soap invented by the ancient Gauls. Before going out for breakfast, he glances through the window made of glass, invented in Egypt, and if it's raining, puts on overshoes made of rubber, discovered by the Central American Indians, and takes an umbrella, invented in Southeast Asia. On his way to breakfast, he stops to buy a paper, paying 
plate with coins, an ancient Lydian invention. His plate is of steel, an alloy first made in southern India. His fork a medieval Italian invention, and his spoon a derivative of a Roman original. This is, he goes through the day, and we've only reached breakfast by now. It's an assemblage of world cultures. But, and this is the lovely ending, nevertheless at the end of the day as he slumps into bed, as he absorbs the accounts of foreign troubles, he will, if he is a good conservative citizen, thank a Hebrew deity in an Indo-European language that he is 100% American. <laughs> um, so we're all composites of history and the art of constructing this is largely an art of bricolage, as David Strauss puts it, putting together bits and pieces. And it is also the art of forgetting. This is the last interesting point I'd like to make. There's um, one of the great theoreticians of nationalism, Renan, a great French um, philosopher and writer, said that the art of constructing a nation is the art of forgetting. We have to forget what differentiates us. Um, if Palestine and Israel are going to come together, if <coughs> Ireland uh, is going to overcome its troubles. You have to forget as much as you remember. You don't have to deny, and you have to, you have to be careful what you remember and what you forget. But if you remember too much, you will remember the hurts and the pains, and you will never unify. So, Renan said that the art of nationalism is the art of forgetting. Um, first question is, are human beings naturally aggressive? Is war caused by aggression? Um, I think the answer from anthropology is that we are competitive in the way that Adam Smith pointed out. And we are quite aggressive, as you can see this from the children and the fights I have with my granddaughter, Lily, and the rest. We love romping around and fighting, and we, maybe some of us even like dominating, conquering, and so on. So that is, <coughs> as with all animals, that is a part of our nature. But the idea that the simplest societies were very warlike uh, is also a fallacy. There was an idea uh, in the 60s, 70s, that if you went back to very simple societies, they were all killing each other all the time. Some of them do, some of them don't. Um, <coughs> I've given you one example, the Piaroa, Brazil, studied by someone called Kaplan. Um, of quiet hunters and gatherers in the forest who don't. They're very, very peaceful. They flee all kinds of violence. The Mabuti, M-B-U-T-I of Congo, studied by Turnbull, are another example. And there are others in Malaysia of small hunter-gatherer groups. They're very, very peaceful. So the ethnographic record doesn't show that we were, as a human species, intrinsically aggressive or unaggressive. There's a mixture, and it depends on the the context. Um, you'll find it in one of the readings on um, the Anthropology of Violence by David Richards, you'll find one or two articles on peaceful and together groups. What is clear is that, uh, that when you move to this situation, a lot of the idea that human beings are naturally very violent comes from the tribal stage, which is quite short, because Forest-dwelling, swiddening, uh, slash and burn, cultivating tribal groups are often very uh, violent. That is, their violence becomes the kind of central code of their culture, and they live, and if there's one thing that unites them, it's violence. The, whether he exaggerated it or not, Napoleon Chagnon, or as he told me, he called his name Chagnon, um, Napoleon Chagnon, um, wrote about the Yanomama, the fierce people, and portrayed them as a very violent group. The group I was brought up next door to as a child and when I became an anthropologist were the Naga people, N-A-G-A, of the Burma border, famous headhunters. I have a number of Naga spears in my home and that influenced me towards anthropology. If you're interested in the Nagas, on my website, you'll see a whole database on the Nagas, photographs, accounts of their lives, and so on. And they are very famous as a warlike people. Their whole culture, their, the way they bring up their children, is based, was based, it's been put down by 
the state to a large extent. Though there's still quite a lot of head hunting up in the north part of the Naga area, I gather from friends who've been up there recently. The Nagas, the Yanomama, the Ifugao, in the Philippines, the Ifugao, that's the I-F-U-G-A-O, and um, many of the New Guinea tribes are famous for their warlike behavior. Now, why are they so warlike? Well, here you distinguish famously between manifest and latent functions. Uh, anthropologists and sociologists. As an analyst, you can say that you can say functionally what this does for the society. For instance, in the famous theory about pigs for the ancestors, it was argued that what it does is keep the ecological balance. <coughs> what the rather intriguing theory of a man called Rappaport, that's R A W P O P O R T in pigs for the ancestors, mm -hmm. is that Women breed pigs. Men have these pigs. When you've got enough pigs, you have a big ceremony. And this ceremony has some rather aggressive gesturing and posturing, which takes place on the edge of your territory. And the neighboring group are then in an under an obligation to counter this sort of aggressive display of wealth. And they often do that by attacking you. You have a war, a number of people are killed, and the put, system is put back into ecological balance and the argument of this school of thought which was very fashionable in the 60s and 70s is that war acts is one of the explanations why these forest dwelling tribal peoples kept their populations in balance for very long periods it maintains the sovereignty and autonomy as Shannon puts of the groups that's the latent function but that's not why people say they do it. The manifest function is they say they have to do it out of revenge. They're being attacked by the ghosts of other groups uh, through personal status and display. In among the Nagas, for example, if you asked why they headhunt, they say, well, the power of a person resides in their head. <coughs> this is the most powerful part, which leads to the, uh, if you can obtain that, like sort of mana, you can then transfer it into the fertility of your society. If you capture a head, you can have great headhunting feasts and displays, which my former supervisor, Christoph von Führer Heimendorf, photographed the book on the Nagas, uh, which is in the Haddon. You can see the wonderful photographs and also on the website, which he took of headhunting displays. They went out, captured a head, brought it back, and all sorts of things you could then wear a trophy, you could then marry a woman. Before you kept, cut off a head, you weren't really eligible to marry a woman. Um, your crops wouldn't prosper and so on. So there were lots of reasons which people put forward. Symbolic, ritual, political, <coughs> a sport, a game, fun, war, all these sorts of things were the reasons people said they did it, but it had other effects. It was also, I think, related to the fact that these are very efficient agricultural systems which create, as I mentioned before, large surpluses. You can um, display them, you can consume them to a certain extent, but also you have large surpluses in the way that America has large surpluses to expend on we weaponry. You can spend it in a destructive way like that if you want. Um, conspicuous consumption and destruction. Those are the forest dwelling ones. The pastoral societies are equally fierce in many ways. And here you get the, the, the sort of warfare between tribes in a forest is a kind of feud, feuding. It's not sustained perpetual warfare. It's a, a constant <coughs> dancing up and challenging and threatening and so on. It's a sort of feud. But the classic work on feud has been done in pastoral societies. The Noah is one famous example. The other, perhaps best example, is Albania, the Albanian blood feud, which was studied by two Cambridge women. Perhaps they were the only people who could really study this. The great, the one great book by Edith Durham on the Albanian blood feud and written in War of Albania. Um, that gives you a documentation of what Albania was like in the early part of the 20th century. The Bedouin are another example. My ancestors, the McFarlands of the Highlands, my father used to tell me their stories of how we used to go out and kill all the Campbells, and the Campbells would come and kill all the McFarlands, and what fun it all was for hundreds of years. 
Um, the Patans, studied by Frederick Barth in uh, Afghanistan, the Mongols. Many of these are feuding, well, the Mongols not so much, are feuding societies. Well, what is feud? Feud, in, a, in essence, is like, just like ch a children's seesaw. That is to say, imagine you are two equal groups. You are one Pathan group, another Pathan group, one Nua group, another Nua group. You, you can't stay in balance. At some point, it happens, and you, um, someone gets injured on one side. At that point, a kind of rather like Mass's gift, a, a relationship of reciprocity or inequality is created, which has to be rebalanced. Like a seesaw, it has to go back and forth. As uh, the Old Testament, which is largely about this kind of world, puts it an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. If they kill one of your people, you have to kill one of them. If you don't, then your honor is d diminished, other groups will attack you, um, you will be ritually impure, and so on. To take an extreme example that Durham puts, if, if one of your relatives traditionally was murdered, you would take the blood from that murdered relative, put it in a jar, and put it on your mantelpiece. <coughs> and until you had killed an equivalent person on the other side, that blood was calling out for vengeance. <coughs> the blood calls out for vengeance. You, you have to repay. In the New Testament, of course, is the replacement of that. God says, I will repay. You don't have to repay the blood, an eye for an eye. That is the great transition. But these societies are ones where you can have, never have equality. It's always back and forth. And many of the people Durham met said, please, you know, we can never get out of a feuding world. Could you ask Queen Victoria, or whoever they thought was running England, to come and sort us out? Need something bigger than us. We can't deal with this. <coughs> now, the parallels between that and many things which we see in our world are pretty obvious. Palestine and Israel is the extreme example. It's a blood feud that's going on. And it can't be sorted out by either side. It may never be. It needs someone from outside who can then take the two feuding parties and say this can't go on. Um, that suppression of feuding, which is a very interesting feature of what happened in the world. For instance, in Scotland, it happened to my ancestors in the 17th century when the crowns of England and Scotland were united under James VI and I, 1603, and the blood feuds were put down. A mixture of religion, Calvinism, and a new political entity, Great Britain, put down the blood feud. It happened to a certain extent in Albania, but it's still partly there. And it's very difficult to end that world of feuding. Um, the very, if you're interested in feuding, a very good book by Black Michaud called Cohesive Force, or as it used to be called, Feuding Societies, gives you an account. What he shows is that, as with the famous case of the Noah, what holds these societies together is mutual hatred and feuding. And this is really the, the state the world is in at a, at a nation state level, because we have a whole lot of feuding nations. We are a, our twin towers are attacked, we will attack you, you attack us, we will counterattack. The war that has now been declared, redeclared by America, which is no longer a war on terrorism, but is a long term war, this is the new phrase, in other words, an endless war, more or less, is a feuding war between us and them, threat and counter threat. This goes on, it takes us into the wars of civilizations, which basically now have changed from feud to real war. The previous ones were war in the Hobbesian sense, which is spelled W A W R E, meaning constant threat and counter threat. The wars of modernity and present civilizations are war with a capital R. And they, they are not disputes and raiding, but they are wars of conquest. Wars of doctrine, wars of gain, those are the three main kinds that one expert has put it, based on Hobbes and Thucydides. Uh, you want to profit by attacking somewhere, you are f frightened as in the Machiavellian preemptive strike, or you want to tell them to be like you, 
most of the European attacks on the third world have been a mixture of these three. What is so curious about the apparent American um, view is that we've turned into a war of doctrine. Um, although I suppose fascism and communism had those kinds of wars too, but basically spreading democracy, that is the doctrine which everyone has got to accept. Um, but one of the, the last points I want to make is that histories of modern warfare, and this may be dealt with for you by others, uh, sees uh, the degree and dangers of war going up and down. He said it isn't all bad news. Warfare up to the 16th, 17th centuries war involved whole populations, the Thirty Years' War in Germany and so on. A third of the German population was wiped out by famine and disease and war because you destroyed the harvest, you destroyed everything. Um, Bill McNeil, who is the, uh, a world historian and who has written about the history of war, suggests that warfare became more civilized from about the 17th century um, because it became more professionalized. You get professional armies, mercenary armies, who are more disciplined. And the wars, you have a pitched battle, and the civilian population are excluded. So that the effects of war in the 18th, 19th century are slightly less than the earlier ones when the Mongols invaded China, something like 100 million Chinese um, died, or 50 million, huge proportion, because they destroyed everything. The wars later on were slightly less destructive, until you, of course, you got to the 20th century, where you begin to get total war coming back again. Um, it goes back and forth. The main thing to remember is it's totally unnecessary. You must this is my personal plea. You must question whether this kind, that kind of world which we, we lived in under the Machiavellian regime and lived throughout my life is necessary at all. We just haven't got the resources on this earth to continue on this line. And the requests of um, political leaders, which you hear all the time, for more weapons, for more systems, for so on, is just completely ridiculous and anyone looking back in 50 years will wonder what we were doing. So there's a passionate personal plea. Thank you very much.